has highlighted for me how important this community is though. Um, we've had more difficulty assessing treatments. We've had more difficulties getting to our doctors, although some of us have had an easier time because of telemedicine. So there have been some good things about this year. We've had more mental health challenges though. Uh, this disease is, is brutal for all of us. And when we feel isolated, when we feel like nobody else is going through what I'm going through, it can be really difficult. But I have seen from this amazing community people stepping up to stay up all night with somebody who's having a rough time online and by phone. I've seen people spending their whole entire afternoon talking to somebody through how to use a different treatment or who to go to to find better care. I, I have seen so much greatness out of this community this year, even though we have been virtual. I think that you all are just amazing people. I don't live with cluster headache myself. Um, but I, I, most of my friends live with cluster headache because this is my family. And I, I have so much great respect for uh, this community because of the strength and the perseverance that you have living with this, this awful disease um, and, and still getting up and having so much joy. So bring that joy to our rooms. Um, we'll try and bring some joy to you. Uh, this was supposed to be, this is the beginning of this year, I started out with, this was going to be our year of heroes. I was like, there's all these heroes in this community, the people that stay up all night, the people like Bob Wald, who have for 20 years been talking to everybody that he could, advocating for better treatments and for helping yourself and for figuring out what works and for, you know, not making the, the choice to end your life because you're living with this disease. And we can understand why you would make those choices, but you don't. Every day you live through these attacks and you don't make that choice. And that in and of itself makes you a hero. Instead, this isn't the year of heroes. This is the year of just getting by. And we're all hanging on by our fingertips, but you're hanging on. So I just want you to know that even though this was supposed to be this big, our 15th year, our year of heroes, you are all heroes to me anyway, because of everything that you do. And for those of you who are caregivers, um, whether you're doctors or researchers or somebody who, who has a loved one with cluster headache, you guys are all heroes as well, because you are are doing your best to support these people um, who, are, who are living with this disease and, and that you stick by and you do it. That's amazing. And that you're attending this conference right now to try and learn more to help people living with cluster headache. Like, thank you. Um, Brian McGinney, who's here with us, he's, um, he's somebody who just started showing up on his own for this conference and learning about it. And he's another just amazing soul and so i appreciate all of you so much uh so so I, we're not going to be able to highlight you but i want you all to remember to keep being amazing doing your best reaching out to each other for help reaching out to cluster busters for help because we're going to keep doing the best that we can for everything do you have anything you want to say bob yeah I'll, all right jump <clears throat> I'll slide in here and say a few words and uh, not too much because you'll hear a lot more from me um, tomorrow and Saturday. Um, but this is the first time in 15 years that um, I didn't have to go out to the smoking area to round everybody up. And um, I was out there before and it's completely deserted. So um, it's a little more difficult rounding everybody up online. Um, it probably would have been easier to pick up a researcher from Germany at the airport than it is to try to figure out how to make it work on time schedules and um, everything else online. But um, Eileen's worked her butt off for a couple of months putting all of this together. Um, I'm sure there'll be a couple of hiccups along the way, but um, we're going to try to pull this all together for you. For the most part, um, as far as presentations go and who you're going to be able to hear from, it's going to be pretty close to what we usually do every year anyways, as far as um, speakers coming up in front of the, the audience and um, presenting their, their research or what it is that they're working on for cluster headaches. Um, so everybody here will be able to get that. The one thing that's going to be uh, missing is the peer to peer and face to face support that's so important in our community. Um, 
but we've made this as interactive as we possibly could. So um, if you're in the, the webinar sections um, and the presentations, be sure to participate and ask any questions you want along um, the time that the presentation is going on. And we will be passing those questions along to the presenters and getting those answers. Um, so feel free to participate. That's a big part of our conferences. Uh, we want to hear from you and we want to be able to answer your questions. Um, if you take a look at your schedule for the next two and a half days, um, you'll probably see some different areas that we'll be talking about that you'll have some questions on. So when you have questions regarding research, you may want to wait until we get to that point in the schedule. Um, but um, and, and kind of plan ahead, but uh, we'll try to answer as many questions as we possibly can. Um, I'm going to be putting on a couple of grow demonstrations. We're going to have some other demonstrations with uh, proper oxygen usage and to help out with that and answer all kinds of questions in those areas. Um, but what you're going to hear from for the next two and a half days are you're going to hear from a lot of people that are working really hard to try to help everybody here lead healthier and better lives, um, whether it's researching for new treatments or being able to properly diagnose cluster headaches and provide the best treatments for everybody. Um, you're gonna find an awful lot of people, uh, one after another, that are working really hard to help the entire community. Uh, there's, um, it's a really impressive lineup that we have and really it's in the medical community itself, how many great people are really dedicated to helping people with cluster headaches and you're going to be able to hear from a lot of them this weekend so thank you very much for that and uh, i'll see you a few more times over the weekend and um, hope you enjoy this evening and the rest of the weekend so thanks for everybody for being here thanks bob i have a couple of just general announcements okay um as bob alluded to because we can't all be in person there's an open zoom um every morning we'll be getting a, a list of all of the sessions you've already received the full agenda but i'm just going to send it again as a reminder every morning the the list of um general sessions and at, on the right side of the page i'm gonna see if i can hold one up to show you um this is Saturdays, but if you see on the left side of the page is the time and the session. The sessions are divided by these lines and on the right side is the link to each session. You'll have this in a PDF. So these links are, are things that are clickable. Um, if you're working out of a, a Mac or like a tablet or a phone, you're going to have to scroll over to see these links. It won't necessarily show up. It depends on how you have your um, PDF viewer set up on those devices. So make sure you scroll over to look for the links, but I'll send them out every morning. Um, and if you have any questions, if you can't get on, if you're, you're having difficulty, you can call me. Uh, my phone number is 443-538-8334. And um, you can email me at conference at clusterbusters.org. And I will do my very best to make sure that we can get you into each of these sessions so that you can learn and, and be with us. Um, at the top of each of these pages is also a link to the open session. It's right here at the top of the page. So anytime you wanna just go in and chat with somebody, have a little heart to heart or you know whatever, just go there, hang out. Um, and then if you have any questions for our presenters, please paste them into chat. If you don't know how to, have, to open, access chat, you're on PC at the bottom of your screen, there's a number of options. There's So there's a chat link. So just open that up and then type in the chat. If you're on a Mac at the top of your screen on the right hand side, there's three little dots. If you click on that, the first option at the top should be chat. So you can open that. You can chat in the chat with everybody. You can ask a question. Our moderators will pull your questions out and then feed them to the MC like Ainsley is tonight. And Ainsley will be able to post them to our, um, our, our speakers like Brian will be tonight. Um, if you have any questions, again, email me, call me. Um, there's also probably a raise your hand option. I can't see it. 
um, but you will be able to see it as a participant. Um, so you can click on that if you if all else fails, click on that, and uh, whoever's running the session will uh, be able to either unmute you or contact you and, and help you with whatever you need help with. Um, yes, so somebody just asked in the chat, are we recording these sessions today? Yes, we are recording all of the sessions for which people have given us permission to record sessions. There are some people, some speakers who are going to talk about things that they don't necessarily want to, to be recorded and they can understand that. And so we are respecting their privacy and we won't be recording those sessions. Um, after Buster Busters is over, after our conference is over, um, we will be posting them on YouTube and as a participant, you will get, um, you will, you will get an email with those YouTube links or you can just check our YouTube periodically and more of them will be posted there. Um, somebody asked if I can see the phone number again, I'm going to post it in the chat in just a minute as well as my email address. Um, but again, my number is 443. 538-8334. Um, and the last thing that I want to ask you all to do while uh, while we're here is please introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're from if you haven't already. Um, this way we can get to know each other a little bit and you can see if there's other cluster heads in your area, maybe get together. Um, in the chat, you can also privately chat with different people rather than having to broadcast it to everybody. Um, so that's another way that you can get to know each other. So I hope you all have a good time. I know this is new and different for a lot of people. So just please let me know if you have any questions and thank you so much for being here. I'm going to turn it over to Ainsley. Well, hello everybody. My name is Ainsley Course. Um, I am the vice president of Cluster Busters and very proud to be so. Um, this is, as Eileen and Bob have said, is all very strange for everyone. Um, I should have actually been in Chicago on Tuesday, um, even although the conference wasn't going to be in person, I was still hoping to be out there, but um, America won't let me in for the time being. So here we are every doing everything virtually. It's all a little bit new to me and uh, my fellow board members will laugh because I am probably the most um, untechnical person there is on this planet, so please bear with me. Um, I, I'm doing my best to kind of keep up with everyone, but I've got some uh, very good people behind me to, to keep me right. So without further ado, um, we have Dr. Brian McGinney here. Um, what can I say about Brian McGinney? Um, super neurologist. Super great guy, great friend to Cluster Busters. Takes a lot of his personal time out to answer questions, not just for me on behalf of, of, of other Cluster Busters, but lots of strangers, people who message him. And uh, he's just an all round great guy. He's a fabulous neurologist. He works at the moment at uh, the J.R. Graham Headache Center, Division of Headache Medicine, Department of Neurology at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. And I really can't praise him enough. He's a great friend to many of us. And I'll hand it over to you, Brian, thank you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Ainsley. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Speak up immediately if you can't. And um, so a special thanks to uh, Ainsley, uh, Eileen, Bob, and all the board at Cluster Busters. And it's an honor and a privilege uh, to talk to this meeting. This is my 11th meeting uh, in a row. And it's been a great learning experience for me and helped me help other people. And that sort of multiplication of information and knowledge is what's so valuable. So uh, we can impart to others, attendees can impart to others who can pass that on again. Um, so this mindset and knowledge is power, as they say. Um, and folks who are familiar with me know that I kind of like to run around with the microphone and interact with the panel, with, with the attendees as much as I can. Um, so I'm, I have some slides to show you, which are really uh, talking points, and I've been given extraordinary uh, latitude. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and so interrupt me. I will try and take as many questions as I can. I, I 
expect and hope you'll throw some questions my way. Please do. Um, and what I have now is actually three screens in front of me so I can put up some slides and um, I will uh, have a clear view of all commentary uh, as well. So here goes for the showing the, okay. Now, one moment. Okay, and now can somebody confirm with me that you can indeed see uh, see my, uh, my title slide? Yes, we can see them, Brian. Uh, wonderful, so I'm gonna move on. And uh, before we really get started, I want to <clears throat> uh, say that uh, it's always important, it's nice and important to see cluster headache represented in a good way, and maybe to call that when it's not represented a good way on the internet. And as a lot of you would be aware, um, it tends to get a lot of press for some uh, controversial treatments, so they say. But I'm particularly interested when they talk about the disease itself, uh, the disorder. And um, l l like most things I know, I was um, alert, alerted by Cluster Nation uh, of this article online last fall. And uh, just as an example of how cluster headache may be represented or not represented that well. Um, and uh, I've just realized I've lost the chat box, which means I can't see the, um, I have a lot of things in front of me. One moment, uh, let's see. All right, um, so I'm reliant uh, on Ainsley and others to comment on the questions because those have disappeared. So this was from last fall. And this young lady with her best interests in mind has regarded cluster migraine as been a a subtype of migraine, which it isn't, of course. The term cluster migraine, when I hear that in the professional community, it's a marker of, how shall we say in correct terms, a, a lack of understanding uh, of the disorder. Uh, and because there really is no such thing. Um, uh, can cluster people get my, can get, can, can they get migraine? Of course, they can get migraine as much as anybody else. Uh, cluster does not infer protection against migraine or for that matter, any other type of headache. And when I hear professionals use that term, it's really a marker of uh, poor understanding or, la or of unease about, or um, uh, uncertainty over what's going on or what the diagnosis is. And, and so, uh, with the best intentions, I had meant to reach out to this uh, young pharmacist, and I didn't. And then when I was looking at slides late last night, I checked up on it, and it was still there. Um, so I did my best to find the email, uh, contact information of that person, of the author, unsuccessfully. And it was on the GoodRx website, went to the GoodRx website. It's very difficult to contact info. Why was they really don't want, I guess, emails are, but where can you in any business that has a Facebook page? So I messaged them at about midnight, very politely. Uh, thank you for your great product. And uh, I think I want to correct an inaccuracy. And they got back to me early this morning and removed that uh, er erroneous entry. So if you look at it now, it does not contain the cluster migraine. Um, so what's the message is, um, don't rely on somebody else to speak out and help this. For, and the point is not to so much to criticize, but to offer help. I offered help and guidance. And they said they would be updating their headache medicine uh, pages and they would may, may reach out to me and that's fine. So the message is, um, uh, keep alert and be the one to make the change. Don't rely on others. Uh, Cluster Nation also, um, I saw this on, on, the, uh, on the internet, on the boards being mentioned. Now, as I, don't, as I don't watch television, I'm not familiar with this program, but it did have a mention uh, of cluster headache and I'll play it to you. And um, if for some reason you don't hear the sound, let me know immediately. Or this lady who suffers from cluster headaches and a friend who doesn't get her to Seattle to be a zombie, she is moving to Oregon to go out on her own terms. Well, that's charming, isn't it? Um, um, I'd like to tell these folks that there are opportunities before you make a one-way trip to Oregon. Whoops. All right. 
And, uh, and that's relatively new, maybe in the last two years. And this is much older, but it's an oldie um, and a goodie. Oops, one moment. No problem. Mushrooms have psilocybin to work on cluster headaches. Pain's getting worse. Need shrooms now. Well, I'm not so sure it would work quite that quickly. Um, and Brian, but, yes. Brian, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I've had a few messages to say that the sound from the videos isn't very loud. Is there anything we can do to enhance that a little from your end, please? Yes. Um, it's, it's, um, I, do you want me to play that again? Would or the you first mind? one again? Great, thank you. I, I can go back to the, to, to the first one. And, that uh, see, that's near the, the top. And, you know. No, seriously. I can't think of anything worse. Well, there are four in Cincinnati, early onset Alzheimer's. Or this lady who suffers from cluster headaches. And if Renegade doesn't get her to Seattle, to be a zombie, she is moving to Oregon to go. Sorry, that's out on her own terms. All right. And this one. Oh, I almost forgot. I need to get a 16 year old magic mushrooms to treat a cluster headache. Is that cool? No problem. Mushrooms have psilocybin to work on cluster headaches. Pain's getting worse. Need shrooms now. All right. Well, it's important for me to go through a few basics of cluster headache. So there has to be some lecture where we talk about some of the basics. And I often show this slide where the name came from. So Professor Kunkel from 1953 to uh, coined the term cluster headache, which is probably the, the simplest of the various eponyms that were available. And so the, the clinical syndrome evolved over decades. And in its present form, um, the credit is to Dr. Kunkel for the use of the term uh, cluster headache. And it's a lot better than having to call it erythroprosopalgia. That's a bit of a mouthful. Um, there's a clinical feature that most of us are aware, but uh, <clears throat> there must be some newbies in the audience. And so this is a condition of recurrent, short-lived, uniformly severe, one-sided headache, um, more common in males and females. It's about three to one. The older ratios were higher. It was likely lack of ascertainment in women, i.e. women were particularly underdiagnosed. And when you see the prevalence of about one in a thousand, that's a lifetime prevalence. When you see prevalence of migraine, it's typically a yearly prevalence, but nobody makes that distinction, unfortunately. Um, and so for by and large, it's pain uh, in the upper third of the head on one side and 90% or more patients have what's known as one-sided autonomic features, most typically tearing of the eye or tearing of the one side nostril or blocked nostril. It's the unilaterality, it's the one-sidedness that's particularly helpful because all of this can happen with migraine, but it's typically bilateral, both sides. One side more than another doesn't cut it. It's truly a one-sided phenomena. Uh, and folks can have as little as um, one attack every day or two days to a couple of attacks a day, as you know. And there's a, a preponderance of attacks at night, but it doesn't have to. And the term cluster comes from the clustering of weeks or sometimes months when you're liable to repeated attacks. And for 90% of folks, it then goes away for months or years, hence the term episodic. So you're either episodic or chronic. You're chronic if in the last 12 months, you haven't had um, a break of attacks for three continuous months, three continuous months. If not, you're chronic. And you can flip from one to the other. Um, and at any one time, approximately 90% of people are episodic. Now, when does it start? Um, there's a concept uh, that's wrong, su suggesting that it's really a disorder of middle age or must come on in middle age, which is really not the case. And this is a, a paper from over 800 consecutive 
patients with cluster headache showing the age of onset uh, in males and females. And this is ep um, both episodic and chronic. I mix them together. Uh, I have other slides with them separated out. You see a fair number of them are occurring at a very young age. And um, on or before uh, 19 years of age in over 20%, 21% of males, 27% of females. And in pediatrics, by the age of 14, at 6.7%, 54 subjects in this study alone. And uh, I have heard of and spoken to family members of people who, as young as five years old, and as even younger in the literature, uh, and, uh, there's a great reluctance to make the diagnosis at that age, unfortunately. Um, it is said that the cluster period, so that's the cluster of, t of weeks or months when you're liable to repeated attacks is more common in the spring and fall. And that is true, but you can have a cluster period at any time and the beast can bubble up. So we can see more common in spring and fall, but really any time, no, any time, there's no time excluded. And uh, folks may hear the term trigemic, trigeminal autonomic encephalalgias or TACs, TACs, and Cluster headache is by far the most, is the most common tack. And um, if you have a cluster attack, but it's much shorter, 10 minutes, and you have more of them, 10, 12 a day, that's more on the, along the lines of paroxysmal hemicrania. You don't need to know this, but you need to know that these diagnoses exist. So in the order of minutes and in the order of seconds, you have sunk. So it's basically the same phenomenology, one-sided, severe, autonomic features, but the length of time would determine which diagnosis. But by far the most common diagnosis in this group is cluster headache. The odd man out is hemicrania continua, which is not a short-lived headache. It by definition is a continuous headache. The important point to note is what's ca quite characteristic is it flares up for a day or two and that's when, it, when it may, somebody may seek medical attention, it may be termed migraine, which it's related to, but it often has, but not always, the one-sided autonomic features. And, all right. And I hope this is okay to show. Uh, there are few triggers for a cluster headache attack, and I'd be very interested in comments that you might have with respect to triggers. Um, Alcohol is a rather reliable trigger, and I, it's difficult for me to fathom somebody in cycle who says that alcohol is not a trigger. I just think they haven't made the link yet. Um, and it's by far the most common, unlike migraine, when many, many factors may be thought to be uh, a trigger. Another trigger for cluster may be, or many, many things, even positioning. Some folks have difficulties lying down flat. And in which case they would even sleep in a, in a chair or up, propped upright. Um, for a lot of folks, hypoxia, so going elevation, climbing a mountain, um, not to eight or 9,000, you really have to get higher than that, 12, 13,000 feet um, before you're more likely to trigger an attack. And for new patients, uh, everybody needs a scan, a head scan. And the reason is there are many mimics. Now, if you've had cluster for years, it's much less likely there are, it's anything else going on. And uh, the challenge is when you newly present, there are many, many things. And what you're seeing on the slide there are all the diagnoses that have presented like cluster headache. Um, again, not as important if you've had it for 10 years, uh, but very important on presentation. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the problems patients have in their interactions with the healthcare community. One of the big, big ones is a late diagnosis and wrong diagnostic, that's endemic. There is a pandemic of late diagnosis with cluster headache. Um, there's a paucity of good guidance, meaning that even if you intera interact with the medical community, you don't necessarily get good guidance on what the disorder is and how to treat it. And that's why we have, um, uh, in fact, that um, the, the book, the Cluster Head book, um, uh, which I'll comment on a little later. Um, 
and lots of treatments uh, of, of limited help. Um, you know, anybody who's been, uh, been doped up um, to pyramate and lost their brain uh, will acknowledge. Um, and what's even what the humorous add on is it often doesn't help as well. Um, so poor interactions with healthcare, difficulties getting an, even an oxygen script from primary care, want to offload all of that to uh, specialists, which may be easygoing if you're in a city, but if you're up the mountains or in a sparsely populated area, it's a problem. Uh, uh, it's the problem of late diagnosis, and I hope Tom uh, allows me, he allows me to take a photo of him, and uh, he's the, uh, the poster child for late diagnoses, who developed chronic cluster headache in 1967, was told he had migraine, and only got the correct diagnosis in 2015. That's quite a delay in diagnosis. Here are some uh, photos from the... Um, meetings I've been to through the years, top left, that's Portland, Oregon, in uh, 10 years ago now. Um, and uh, Brian, can I put, yes. uh, pose a question for yes. you for, for Mark? Um, a little earlier you showed the, the graphic um, about the, the age of onset. Yes. And he's asking, does this graphic suggest that the headache ends after the age of 70? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah I'm quite, I, I, I welcome questions. Um, and, um, <laughs> well, what, um, no, um, this is the age of onset. It is not the age of, um, it's not a, um, a, a point prevalence. Imagine if you today, interviewed everybody in say Massachusetts, identified those who have cluster and got the active cluster or cluster and got their ages. It's a different graph. This is purely the age of onset. Um, you know, what I haven't seen is a graph of when it goes away, their last cluster headache. And um, maybe that would be something that uh, Mark, Dr. Burrish and colleagues might be able to say, do we have data on that? I don't even think it's asked. For those who've had cluster, when was your last attack? Um, or those who have never had it again. You can never say you're totally free of it. I hate to say it, but I've seen it bubble up after 10 years or more. And I'm wondering, wondering, has anyone had that experience as well? So this is age of onset. And so you might ask, well, if you've reached 70 and, and you, you don't have cluster, are you never going to get it? It'd be very rare to get it after that. Um, but it doesn't mean it goes away. This is purely an onset uh, graph. Um, and all right. So, Brian, I have another yes. question. Yes. Wouldn't mind. Um, thank you. So, this question is from Terry Smith. So, he asks on your to pyramid comment is that something that you personally would recommend cluster patients stay away from? Uh, excellent question. Um, I, um, there's no good, um, there may be case reports and even an anecdotal success in the use of topiramate and cluster headache. However, the chance of success is low. And um, I can't say I've never used it, but I'm, I'm very unenthusiastic about using it because of the amount of failures. And um, it's a potent enough drug. It's safe, medically safe. Uh, but if it turns your brain into a rutabaga temporarily, that's a, that's a no good. Um, so I am very unimpressed with its usefulness in cluster headache. It's an impressive migraine prophylactic agent, but you have to be careful of tolerability and side effects. Um, I'm going to touch on some uh, treatment options and medications, but that's, that's a good question. Um, any other questions, Ainsley? I'm, or I I'm do have some other questions for you, yes. So um, Katie has asked, can babies get cluster? Um, she said she screamed at exactly 6 p.m. Uh, for exactly one hour, 10 minutes for nearly two years as a baby. Oh, oh, she, uh, um, she, she well, when she, she was said, a baby. Yes, so she's asking, you know, do yep. you believe that 
that babies can have cluster headache? You know, it's in the literature for, I think somebody was under, just under two years old, unfortunately. And this person has been subsequently diagnosed with cluster headache later on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's definitely, definitely in five-year-olds. Um, and I think the youngest one may be uh, 18 months, two years of age. Um, very interesting comment. So the, the trouble is when you only uh, see what you believe, you see what you believe. And most physicians wouldn't believe you get at that age. So it's not diagnosed. And the tragedy is uh, pediatricians don't get educated on this. They don't get educated on it because they rely on pediatric neurologists to teach them. And the pediatric neurologists don't have the experience. Uh, or don't regard this as something worthy of, of commentary. And um, for one reason or another, uh, there are many, many, it's often missed in the early years. It's very difficult, admittedly. Um, any other questions? Can we have one more question and then we can let you go on sure. with your slides a little and then take some more questions? Yep. So Bernie asks, um, have you had any experience or knowledge of using low dose naltrexone for pain with cluster, uh, for pain relief with cluster headache. Uh, low dose naltrexone has been uh, looked at in various chronic pain states for well over twenty years, and there is a rationale in in certain um, somatic pains, or um, so that's typical bodily pains, but. Um, I have, I have no experience, and I actually think it would not be useful in cluster, such as the nature of the cluster pain. Uh, I do not feel that would be useful, um, but good question. Uh, yes, thank you for that, Brian. Uh, the slide on late diagnosis, while some people are diagnosed pretty quickly, uh, if you have a less than a textbook presentation and symptoms, it's often delay, a particular delay. If you start talking about pain in the mid face, dental pain, uh, ear pain, mid face pain, that will throws off the average practitioner who would often discount cluster. Uh, or if you don't pick up on soft uh, tearing on one side, um, that, uh, and, or if you don't uh, identify the autonomic features or if there aren't any, guaranteed you have a late diagnosis if you don't have autonomic features. Often you might be labeled migraine. Uh, in one study of over 1,100, nearly 1,200 patients with cluster Dutch study, the mean time to diagnosis was three years. Um, they were being diagnosed with sinusitis, extremely common, migraine, dental related, and 16% having dental extractions and even ENT operations. Nice. Even the migraine community has, has the ENT operations, but not the dental extractions. The dental extractions relate to the severity of the pain. And um, someday soon, I'm going to have a meme um, reminding dentists not to extract. Before you extract, think cluster. Um, and the particular clinical point is, both dental pain and cluster headache can be severe. When dental pain is severe, it's typically pulp pain in the pulp of the tooth. That doesn't last for two months. If you've got two months of severe headache, it's cluster. It's not in this manner. If you're thinking cluster or dental, it's cluster after two months because you do not have um, continuous intermittent history of severe dental pain going on for many weeks. That's the pearl. Um, and here's a uh, tattoo from a man attending a cluster buster meeting. It must be close to 10 years ago now. Um, and uh, oxygen being the abortive therapy. Um, um, uh, I'm not going to play it, but um, uh, Andrew Clementshaw gives a, an outstanding talk on his personal navigation of the medical system as a child. It's shocking. And he would have been better off not interacting with the medical community until he was an adult. Um, and it's a particular problem. You know what? I, I, yeah. I'm happy to play that, but not at this time. It's just in the interest of time. And the trouble with treatment, there are many fundamental problems uh, in treating. 
uh, we don't have good evidence-based medicine. So often we're, we're, we're skiing off piste, so to speak. Our, evident, our good evidence is limited. And there's a big need for more treatment options and a big need for more research. And admittedly, um, there have been great strides in that. The efforts of uh, Dr. Robert Shapiro at University of Vermont and colleagues um, who've uh, organized great lobbying of, um, uh, of Washington. And I know Clusterbusters were involved with that. And I told Clusterbusters about that first, um, about them. Um, and a patient often decouples from, from, phys from physician care. So with all uncommon disorders, it's not, it's, it's, one comes across a situation where the patient knows maybe as much as the, as the primary care or treating physician. And that tends to lead to a disenchantment of the patient who may decouple from care and do their own thing. And that's why, one of the reasons why I had to go to the cluster, a cluster headache meeting uh, Cluster Busters meetings to listen to the stories and uh, examples of how uh, the limited care is uh, for a long time there was only one treatment of abortive treatment injection sumatriptan uh, so headache treatment can be divided, divided into abortive and prophylactic or, or chronic and the prophylactic is to reduce attacks um, I'm going to expand on this but there is now an approval for the prophylaxis of episodic cluster headache, that is emgality. That's a trade name made by Lilly. I have no conflict of interest in the last year with Lilly or last few years. Um, I have a few slides on this. Um, and, uh, and the rule for treatment, for those of you who haven't heard, uh, it's my rule, it, uh, that if uh, you have to think about whether your treatment is working for cluster headache, it's not working clearly because uh, you're going to know whether you've been um, ax murdered uh, at night or not. Um, and the goal here is no, no attacks and not a reduction of one or two. Um, and so there's abortive prophylactic and sometimes we use the term transitional to try and knock you into remission. That's where steroids come in. So steroids like prednisone, and of late I'm using a lot more dexamethasone. It may be better, I don't know, but it may be better. Um, will most people reliably knock them into remission, especially the first time the cluster sees it, it's not used to it, and you may uh, lose your attacks immediately. Uh, the trouble is it may come back when you stop the steroids, uh, and you may or may not want to continue the steroids. The physician doesn't want to keep prescribing because uh, the patients end up turning into too much like a chipmunk and everything um, with the steroids. Um, and that's a topic of discussion itself. Um, we have guide, when we, the American Headache Society, have guidelines on abortive treatment. And you should know that there's only good evidence for the sumatriptan injection, high flow oxygen via non rebreather mask, and the zolmatriptan nasal spray. Uh, at even five and 10 milligrams. The 10 milligrams is not a FDA approved dose, but it is shown in the literature. So you can't write that on a script, otherwise pharmacy has a uh, seizure um, and wants you to rewrite it. Uh, we're gonna look a little bit more. Everything else, there really is little in the way of evidence. This is not something to pay too much attention to. It's not as if that the level Bs uh, still have a lot of merit not really. And uh, whoops. Um, anything you will realize sooner or later that in, in order to abort an acute an attack, which is short lived, that oral options are not useful. Uh, and why? Because oral pills and medication take one to two hours to kick in typically. And yes, you may, may work it out that it takes a little shorter, but it's still a long time when the outcomes in sumatriptan are 10 to 15 minutes. A sumatriptan tablet, if you have longer attacks, will kick in in an hour, but you really want to go there. And so patients may have a certain amount of annoyance when they realize that what they really needed as an abortive um, was injection sumatriptan or high flow oxygen. And so I often show this. And uh, be careful of practitioners who want to give you oral medications as an abortive first. 
and that's my most PC I can be about it. Um, even if you don't prescribe it on first visit, you kind of need to mention it, mention these options. There may be access issues. Uh, oxygen, I'm not going to say that much about oxygen. How are we doing for questions? Okay, so um, just going back a little bit when you were talking about the, the dental problems, and we've all experienced that, I'm sure. Um, Tom said he had all four healthy wisdom teeth removed in 2006, um, with, and it didn't help him at all. He got no benefit from that. Well, the, uh, the, the only benefit he got is he'll never have to need a root canal in his wisdom, wisdom exactly. teeth. Exactly, and he's probably got slightly higher cheekbones as well. So I'm told. Um, also, your, your quote about if you have to wonder if your treatment is working, it's not. Uh, Christy Lancaster says, my favorite Dr. M quote, and <laughs> Todd agrees. Absolutely. Um, Doc, should a chronic CH sufferer who has found some relief through alternative medicines even bother with having a neurologist? In your opinion, is it essential for a cluster headache patient to have regular visits to a neurologist? Um, good question. Mm -hmm. uh, incidentally, when I'm talking, can you see me or no? You just see the slide, is it? Um, no, I can see everything. I can yeah. see I can see the chat, the slide, and I can see you too. Can you okay. see me? Yep. Yes, I can see I you. Just you and I on screen at the moment. Uh, oh, um, that's a really good question, and and I think what you mean is after the diagnosis is clear, there's no question you've had it for a while. And that's what you mean. Um, and I would say kind of yes, you want to prescribe, you want to be remain, I would say active because you want to prescribe her. Let's say drug X comes on the market and it's really good for cluster and you go to your primary care and they balk at it. They're almost conditioned not to, you know, to push people off to specialists. And if you don't have an active one, you may have a difficulty getting into a specialist in, in a timely manner. But if you're on the books for somebody you can get in as a follow-up pretty quickly. And in these days of virtual visits, you may not even have to show up if you're an established patient. And um, so the answer is, I would encourage people, I understand where you're going with it, for it to periodically, uh, uh, and you, you may need a script for oxygen, or you may just, just to keep it active. Because uh, if you call looking for something, or your primary care is, on, is, is not available and you, you need to write, get your, your sumatriptan written. You want to have somebody else. You want, so I would encourage one to do a yearly or something like that. Great. And you, it might be difficult. I mean, if you're episodic and you may go a year without an attack, um, yeah, it gets more difficult. You know, I mean, why am I showing up if I haven't had an attack? You're kind of showing up so that you remain on their panel of active patients. Yeah. Great, great answer, Brian. Thank you. We also have um, a question from uh, Elizabeth asking, what do you think of Mgality? Yep. And I'm going to jump. Uh, good question. And the uh, I am going to... Okay. All right. Okay. So um, for those, I, I should really recap and to make sure everybody uh, follows us. Um, this is a medication that first came out two years ago. The F uh, came out first approved for migraine prophylaxis. And about a year or two ago, a year ago, was approved for uh, episodic cluster headache. This is a monthly injection <clears throat> administered by the patient. Um, it was shown to be beneficial in episodic cluster headache. It was not shown to be beneficial in chronic. Um, and not, and what it is, is a monoclonal antibody. That is a designer antibody. And antibodies are smart bombs. They're targeted to take out, uh, typically, small peptides, proteins. And this takes, happens to take out CGRP, which is a peptide, a protein, that's involved in headache. And um, it was shown to reduce the frequency of attacks, I think, uh, two or three weeks after administration in somebody in an active cycle. Now, 
part of the problem with studies like this is first of all it's difficult to do studies in cluster headache and uh, there are few there aren't that many people and then the metrics that you use how well do they reflect the usefulness of the treatment you see um, you may have the same number of treatment of attacks but the intensity may fall a lot and sometimes rapamil does that that's still extremely beneficial or you may be on a prophylactic agent, same number of attacks, but you respond extremely quickly to abortive agents when you didn't previously. And that's also useful. Or your a length of attacks may shorten, or you may lose your night attacks. All of these are beneficial, but they wouldn't be reflected in, for instance, the Mgality study. <clears throat> so, and that's a defense of medications that I find difficult to show useful. But I'm a bit of a, I'm a stickler for evidence. And what I really want, so what do I think? I think it, it some people do get benefit. Um, how many we don't know yet. Uh, you can't really extrapolate that from the studies because the study population isn't exactly the, a sample population of those who cluster. Um, uh, it, it likely does help. I and mean, you really, you're looking for something that helps an awful lot. And it doesn't interact with other medications and doesn't affect the liver, doesn't cause, does not cause drowsiness, dizziness, or cognitive thinking, memory problems. It will not turn you into a Ruda Vega. So it's kind of useful if you can get your hands on it to try it. You don't have much to lose. And the idea is for most episodics, anyway, you, you would stop it. You wouldn't keep going every single month. I need to make the point that the dose is totally different to migraine. It's three 100 milligram syringes, which you do yourself just under the skin. Don't be scared. You can be scared of needles and still administer it. And it takes a week for the antibodies to get into circulation. So don't make a judgment after two or three days. And the, um, it'll likely store in the refrigerator for two years. It may say one year on the package. So I think people should have it in their refrigerator and we get a better idea how useful it is. Um, so, you know, a month into a cycle, maybe a bit late to try it. Um, and just like I advise patients to stock up on subcutaneous sumatriptan or even a steroid course, uh, this as well, ideally. So you don't have to go chasing in a panic, a physician for your first script when you've gone into cycle. Um, but to get back to your question, I, we need to identify who's um, going to respond really well to it. And it probably, and this is off label now, there are probably people with chronic who do respond, uh, but we just were not able to demonstrate uh, that on the, uh, in the study. You will see literature in the me in medical literature coming out, which is not a randomized control trial and not uh, without a control. Uh, of people getting better when administered chronic people getting better temporarily anyway. And that introduces more possible errors and one must be open-minded on that. But, but yes, that's a very long answer to a simple question. I'm sorry, but it is topical. A any other top quest questions? Um, I have a question and a few comments. So I'll just, uh, I'll give you the question first and then run through the comments and perhaps you could come back to answer the question. So oh, um, by, by the way, if I just say, and sure. uh, if the patient is really annoying, I just tell them to inject under the toenail. Yeah. <laughs> I'm well, kidding. Lovely. <laughs> it couldn't be any more painful than a cluster. <laughs> okay, so Terry Smith, uh, uh, Terry Smith asks us, um, are kudzu supplements a useful medication for cluster headaches? Kudzu. Kudzu is a, is a, is a plant um, which has not been subjected to evidence-based medicine. And you'll see it in case reports. And um, the only way to go beyond that then is clinical experience. And I have to say, I do not have a feel for the usefulness of that. There is no proof. So case reports and case series of people doing well are is hypothesis generating. You can, uh, the, the, the hypothesis generated is, it's useful and it works. It's not evidence. Um, and I actually don't have a good feel for it, but yes, it's in the literature. 
Uh, and then the next question is, is it safe? And my understanding is, yes, it is. It is safe. And I know physicians, um, I maybe have, should push it more, admittedly. And it may be useful. That's the best one can say. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a few comments going down the list here. Mark Benny, he agrees with seeing a neurologist um, or, or keeping your, your neurologist um, Just a moment. On, oops, on file. Um, his knew about Engality before the FDA approval. So he got it within, uh, you know, when it was first approved. Um, Ken Maxwell tells us that um, Unfortunately, he can confirm it does not help chronic cluster headache. Um, yeah, in, in, in his experience, and in most people, in most people, it's not going to help. Um, yeah, in his but, experience, although the next comment from Mark Benny says he is chronic patient and still got relief from angality. So, as you quite rightly explained to everyone, you know, different people react in different ways, to different things. One of our biggest deficits in headache medicine is, and it's a really big deficit, it's not talked about, is we cannot predict whether somebody's going to respond well to a treatment or not. Yeah. Even though the spectrum goes from does nothing to miraculous, we cannot predict. Um, and you have to live with that uncertainty. Uh, and, and that's a part reason not to overhype treatments when you sell it like a cure, run from anybody who says they have a cure, by the way. Um, and, and then you lose respect. And if you don't have respect, you have nothing in, in, a, in, a, in a provider relationship. Um, but that's, uh, that's a good option. Um, to give you an example of how lacking we are in, um, in treatment, the prophylactic agent the classic one of choice that everybody gets put on at some stage, most, is verapamil, known as a calcium channel blocker. It's, um, uh, you know what, I'm gonna put, let me find where it is. Uh, uh, I'm gonna come back to that. And however, I'm going the other way, sorry. Uh, but if you ask what's the evidence that verapamil is useful, in, uh, maybe I'm missing out where the slide is, sorry about that. Um, there is one study against placebo only, one randomized control trial. It only had 30 patients and eight people had prior experience with verapamil, which is typically an exclusion when you're studying a, a product. So there's one other randomized control trial, but it was randomized to lithium. So you can't demonstrate true usefulness. You can only demonstrate relative use compared to lithium, and it was similarly effective, um, but, but less side effects than lithium. Um, so verapamil, um, so we overhype it. Yes, it can work. It can work because it can stop attacks, reduce intensity or frequency, but it can also uh, cause <laughs> tremendous constipation and do nothing for your cluster and cause you to faint or drop your blood pressure at high doses. And it's generally the doses raised to the physician's level of comfort. Um, it's not going to kill you. Worst thing it might do is flip you into an emergency slow heart rhythm. It's not a medical emergency. It's not, it's, that's not going to kill you. Um, but it flips your heart rate to maybe 25 beats a minute, 30 beats. And you go to ground and you'll curse the person who prescribed it when you realize what's going on. It always goes back to normal when you stop it. Any questions? Or I'm happy to move on. Um, uh, I just um, a few comments actually. Um, Dr. Manuel Schindler um, has said for information to veterans, Engality is available at the VA. That's wonderful. Available. Yes, that's fantastic. Um, a lot of people saying they've tried um, Engality, but think they took it a little bit too late, and a lot of their doctors won't actually prescribe it for them to stock in their toolbox, if you like. Um, so therefore, by the time they started it, their cycles were yeah, already the, established. Yeah, that's, that's, it, yeah, it's yeah. too late. So you need to get it and refrigerate it. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I want to show you something very useful, if I may. 
and I, I've been doing it the last few years, the clinicaltrials.gov. Um, do you have it up on your screen now, my slide? Uh, let me just check. No. So you don't have my yeah. slide? Oh, hang on. I'm screen sharing. All right, I have to, oh yes I do, it's here now, I have it now. Okay, so clinicaltrials.gov, and I'm gonna go into it live. And one moment, uh, I'm going to, one moment. Okay, do you see that up on the screen now? Clinicaltrials.gov? Yes, I do. Okay, so here's what you're gonna do. So you see, this is a, a, a registry run by the federal government so citizens can find out what clinical studies are ongoing, completed, or upcoming uh, for various disorders. It's a wonderful, it's one of the few examples of just a great federal service. So cluster headache, and you go search, and it has a registry of 98 studies. Uh, now, one thing you could do is you can go on a map, say on map, you see that? Mm -hmm. And where you live. Uh, some places, mm, you kind of out of luck, um, but others, and this is where ongoing clinical trials. So let's say uh, you click United States, and here are some sites. The sites enable, um, and you can click Massachusetts. So that's, that's a resource. I'm going to show you what you get. And over on the left, recruiting and not recruiting yet. So these are the hottest things, maybe. Um, I'm going to flick down. And we'll see LSD as a treatment for cluster, and that's in Switzerland. Interesting, and that's ongoing. Uh, wonderfully interesting. Uh, we have PACAP38, that's a, a small peptide infusion cluster headache, and that's Denmark. And they're really on the ball. Notice the way Denmark just uh, about six months ago started these studies, and the um, prophylactic effects of psilocybin and cluster headache that Dr. Schindler has been doing. Oh, actually, or, uh, Maybe she's been uh, episodic and chronic. And then the ketamine intra in, intranasal spray for the treatment of chronic cluster. And this is something we've been speaking about at Cluster Busters for years. Mm -hmm. um, and for instance, you can go into that, click into it. Now it's only, uh, I don't think there are any US sites, but you can see that they, they, what she's using is a concentration of 150 milligrams per mil, which is quite the concentration and I wonder where, how she reached that. But it's wonderful to see that, and that's ongoing. Uh, what else is ongoing? I'm going to, I think you guys would get interested to see this. So, um, uh, bah, bah. okay, let's see. one moment. Okay, and, all right, and, uh, that's the 21 studies. Uh, occipital nerve stimulation and intractable. So these stimulation studies are either implanted stimulation studies or surface electrodes. Even the implanted studies overall, how are we for time? You let me know and we can stop. No, we're, um, we're okay right now. We're good. So, so the, the, the uh, implantable stimulation studies, roughly about two thirds of patients get 50% relief. Overall, now certainly you, you read of mir miraculous outcomes, but overall in everybody, on implantables, about two thirds of people get 50% relief. And yes, there are people who get more, but that's all encompassed in that number. Um, and the, uh, the external, there are external, and there are, um, the in, when I say internal, in the brain, in the brain. And then there's implantable electrodes outside the skull, around the occipital nerve, Maybe not so great. Um, wouldn't be better than two thirds. I think Dan Dan Irvin knows all about that. I think a few other people as well. Uh, but the outside the skull implantations are a lot safer. Um, so this is where you and here, uh, Dr. Burrish has a study. That must be Dr. Burrish's study, I think. Uh, I presume. Um, this is where you, the uh, uh, cluster nation, can go in and see what's going on. These are interventional studies that have been pre-registered. You register the study beforehand. Um, and uh, so if you take away the, the search limitations, 
and you see ones that have all, all also finished. Uh, um, uh, intra, and this is intranasal cooling, and this uses something called a rhino chill. All right, bring it on, rhino chill. <laughs> um, the mind boggles, but uh, this is a this is a bona fide study, and I, I showed this last year. This is a looks like a coin, and has little needles, tiny needles implanted with zolmatriptan. Uh, as an abortive for cluster headache. And the numbers on, on migraine, the, the data was very good. And this may be a very good option, albeit expensive because it's a device. And I don't know what the latest, but it looks like, oh, it's still recruiting. Um, so you can find out if you're near to that. I think that's worth uh, having a look at. Um, and uh, I'm going to get back my slides now. Uh, I have a few more questions, Brian. Yes, if that's sure. Okay. I, I just want to say to our attendees that uh, we've had a lot of questions tonight. And um, obviously, unfortunately, we can't get to all of them live here on our sessions. Um, so we'll do as many as we possibly can within the time. But, um, you know, don't worry if we can't do it in the session. We will try to do it afterward in a, in a follow-up uh, communication. So, um, Brian, Melanie asks, how effective, if at all, is the sphenopalatine ganglion ablation for chronic cluster headache? No, it's sphenopalatine ablation. It's not sphenopalatine stimulation. <laughs> yeah, ablation, the, the, yes. Yeah, yeah, there was a, um, so the sphenopalatine, uh, uh, ablation. This is a ganglion, a collection of nerves, uh, really deep in the nose. Um, it's <clears throat> separated from the outside, your nasal cavity, by a layer of mucosa. So it's not even separated by bone as well. So it's accessible to get near it. Um, and so because it's accessible, it's been subject to treatments in the setting of headache medicine and facial pain. You okay, Ansley? I can see you nodding your yeah. head. No, it's no, it's good. It's good. Sorry, just a little problem with one of my little furry babies. Um, um, but it's all good. I'm sorry. That's all right. And um, so um, there are device, two separate devices already in the on the market to introduce a local anesthetic to the region of the sphenopalatine ganglion. And that ganglion has been subject to a trial a few years ago, as some of you know, where you get implanted a stimulator into your face. Um, now, to ablate it though, I don't think that's a great option. Uh, and what goes in there are certain relay information that uh, autonomic, it's an autonomic relay station. Uh, autonomic doesn't so much give you, isn't as much involved in the pain, uh, but the tearing, nasal blockage, nas running nose, but it does influence the pain. But I don't feel that's a good option um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me um, uh, to ablate it. Um, it really doesn't. And even if you have a good outcome initially, it's very difficult to know an individual. And I think you'd be back to square one. So I'm not so, I'm cool on, I'm not so cool, uh, not so supportive of ablation. It will, however, not give you anything and particularly nasty if it is ablated. Okay, I'm going to give you one more question and again just remind um, our attendees here tonight that Brian will be doing a Q&A session on Saturday afternoon. So perhaps, you know, join us for that and uh, if we haven't been able to cover your question um, today, then we'll attempt to do that on, uh, on Saturday afternoon. So Terry Smith asks, um, just one final question for Dr. McGinney. Would he recommend trying the IV DHE procedure for cluster headache? A good question. Uh, DHE is dihydroergotamine. So it's a form of ergotamine. Ergotamines have been used in headache for many, 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 many decades. Uh, DHE, dihydroergotamine, ha happens to be a form that causes less nausea. Ergots cause a lot of nausea and less peripheral vasoconstriction. That's a, a side effect. The trouble with 
dihydrogotamine is, it's very poorly orally absorbed. So you have to give it in a route other than oral. Um, it's currently available as a nasal spray for a long time, even before the triptans came out. And it's been used in hospital medicine, IV and infusion for a couple of decades, but was popularized about 35 years ago by a famous headache physician, Neil Raskin from uh, UCSF. And his, his, the term Raskin protocol refers to inpatient treatment with IV DHE every eight hours for about two days, six doses or more. And that's for migraine. But because it was uh, available for migraine, it was tried in cluster. It tends to reliably switch off the attacks. The trouble with it is the attacks come right back when you stop the medication. Uh, there is a tendency for ergots to have a tail, a beneficial tail effect, which doesn't exist for triptans, meaning the benefit you get may linger for a while, days or even weeks. And that can happen with migraine. It's less common to happen with cluster. Uh, but, and um, it may be safer just to blast of steroids. Uh, they may be similarly switch it off. Um, so it can rely, and then I try and mimic an inpatient stay at home with nasal spray every eight or 12 hours. Uh, even you can get DHE vials and inject under the skin. Um, and then you can do your own course at home. Although we typically have a slightly lower dose when the patient is doing it at home. Um, but I haven't done much of it of late because I think I can achieve what I want to achieve with other options. And it does have some baggage. These are dirtier drugs than triptans. Dirtier meaning it do, they have more actions and with it more potential side effects and concerns. Sure. Terry says, thank you very much for the DHE explanation. And uh, how, how are you doing with your slides, Brian? I, I'm good. I'm just going to, uh, I'm happy to take more questions. Okay. Um, um, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit and try and um, cover some comments and, and yep. questions that we've had. Um, I just didn't want to interrupt you if you're still with your want to go you know what I, I, I will to, allow me for it to say I have to say a few words about sumatriptan sure. um, so the sumatriptan injection a uh, triptan this has been a bit of a gold standard it's one of the two best abortive options uh, on the screen uh, it it came out as a six milligram injection but there's now four and three are available um, up on the top and uh, these are often what the generic injections look like now. And, and I use these myself. And you pop off here and that the needle is in there. You don't even see it. You put it to your skin, you press the top and you keep it there for 10 seconds. Does it hurt? Yeah, it can burn for 10 seconds at most, but that's it. Um, and this is the old style when it first came out 25 years ago. And cartridges, and this is the original pen, and you screwed it on. And those of you in the know uh, will be aware that you can get vials of sumatriptan, um, six milligram vials, and then you can get insulin needles. You don't need a prescription for the, the syringe and needle combo. You can get a hundred of these for about 20 bucks or less online. And you can give yourself a smaller amount of sumatriptan. You just may respond to two milligrams or three milligrams, in which case, it goes further, which isn't as maybe it wasn't as much of a big deal if you have one attack a day, but it can mean everything if you have half a dozen attacks a day. Um, now, about 91% of people will be persistent responders. Not everybody, and it is amazing, not everybody responds to anything. Um, and if, for, if there are often limitations, payer or insurance limitations to the amount of injection, which is why you should stock up when you're quiescent, when you're between cycles, stock up. If you're urgent and you need um, to pay cash, the cheapest way is to go to goodrx.com and you'll see five vials for about $50, $60. Wow. Whereas uh, the generic injections may go for $50, $60, $70 each. 
yeah. generic. Um, so that's your, the cheapest way of getting it. Uh, and so I wanted to, to mention that. Uh, all right, questions. Okay, so um, Steve has asked, does Gamma Core work for cluster patients? Yep. Your opinion. <laughs> Uh, and I think I think I might have uh, da, da, da. okay. So Gamma Core, this is a device, and it's a it's a non-invasive device. So you 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 don't stick it in any orifice, um, but you put it to your neck. It has a it has an FDA approved indication to treat a board of uh, attacks of cluster headache if you're episodic. It also has a separate indication as an adjuvant for prophylaxis of cluster headache. Um, I, um, I have been, I was, I've been a critic of the data of it. And, you know, the company has reached out to me and made some very in, good comments about it. And, you know, you can't cover everything or do everything right. Um, but, this is something that clearly has, has been shown in two big studies, in good studies, not to work in chronic cluster, but it works in episodic, which leads me to think that if, it's, if the treatment may be weak in that it only uh, is aborts episodic, but when I say only abor ab aborts and episodic, I've been unimpressed um, to say something positive about it. It is completely safe. It's a little electrical signal, but it's completely safe. In, in that respect, you know, it's never, uh, it's not a terrible thing to try because you are not risking anything except cost. It's just I've been unimpressed uh, by the data. Um, and it, you do need a, a prescription, <laughs> even though it's a non-invasive. Uh, and it's a very nice idea. And the company did very good studies um, right. and they were strictly there were negative studies but when they broke them down episodic chronic they did see a signal um, so I have to admit uh, I, I'm and but I invite people to tell me their story who feel they've had success with it sure um, but it's more I'm more listening to the those who have success with abortive with chronic you could switch off, or with episode you can switch off anyway in cluster, but you're gonna, those who have use, if it's, if it's truly useful in aborting attacks, they'd be repeatedly using it and they get a good idea of how useful it is. So that's the best I can give for that answer. Great, thank you. Um, Ashley Hartle asked us now, this is a, a great question and observation. So um, can you touch on common oxygen concerns such as oxygen toxicity yes, and yes. Using oxygen? Apparently, yes. there was a recent Facebook question in one of the Facebook groups, uh, and I've come across this before here in Scotland um, and the rest of the UK. I don't know what it's like for, for the United States and Canada, where someone thought being a smoker excluded them from using oxygen because of the dangers. Now, here, I don't know what it's like in the United States, Brian, but here in Scotland, it's, it's a bit of a postcode or zip code lottery. It depends very much where you live as to whether you will be prescribed oxygen if you are a smoker. Damn. It, it, right. So if you are a smoker, which I am, I've never had a problem. I had to fight hard to get my oxygen, mm -hmm. but smoking was not a concern in amongst this fight. Although people who live 20, 30 miles from me will not be given oxygen because they are a smoker. So that's, yes, that's a, that, that's a, yes. you, well, part of the difference in the US, there are less, the prevalence of smoking is notably less, notably. Um, oh, we're an unhealthy lot here in Scotland. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Deep fried Mars bars and-, and it's, a, it's a lack of sunlight in the winter. And, exactly. Not enough and and it's, it's, the, uh, it's the poison haggis. Um, it's the poison haggis indeed that would bite you at night um, yeah <laughs> it, from, it runs out from the bushes and uh, <laughs> it does with one leg <laughs> or one leg shorter than the other big hairy and, thing it is um, you, but 
it's a yeah. great question. Yeah, it is. And you see, I can tell you when I went to medical school, we were kind of taught that you shouldn't give oxygen to people with smoke because it'll only, they'll, sooner or later, they're going to blow themselves up. Um, and that's not giving much credit uh, to the smoker. Um, no. I mean, there are many responsibilities we get given. Driving is probably a very big one, um, but you won't trust them with oxygen because they might blow themselves up. Um, well, you know, most p patients don't want that to happen. And, um, and the oxygen used in cluster is for a short period of time. These physicians were trained uh, for people with cardiopulmonary disease, where they're going to need oxygen all the time. So these physicians are used to not giving oxygen to patients who could use it all the time, in which case there's no time to smoke. Right. But the cluster person is only using it 5% of the day. Um, so that's not a problem. And that's the argument. So that's the argument is they're so conditioned to answering as if the patient had bad lungs. Yes. They don't I, have. That, yeah, that brings me on to your opinion on, and I know you've talked about this before at, at um, our conferences, and it's quite a common question. Oxygen toxicity, yep. is it a concern for, um, for cluster heads? By, by and large, no. There is a thing called oxygen toxicity. It's more known in intensive care units where you get given pressurized oxygen for some time. And it's yes. well recognized and there is a toxicity and there's damage to the lungs that may continue after being in intensive care for years and decades. Mm -hmm. um, that is not applicable to high flow oxygen. Um, and number two, every medical student knows that you have to be very cautious or uh, about oxygen in somebody who's a, a CO2 retainer. So it's carbon, if you have bad lungs and happen to be in a situation where you retain carbon monoxide, good dioxide, uh, giving supplemental oxygen then can reduce your drive to breathe and your breathing rate falls. Um, which, which uh, but <clears throat> however, it's not clear that that's at all a risk when you're giving oxygen for 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. And in the setting of severe pain, you ain't just going to collapse. I don't think so. So it's not a risk and not a risk. Um, nevertheless, um, you know, a, no, a little bit of information is a bad thing. And I will never forget having to reach out to a psychiatrist who had one of my patients as an inpatient uh, for depression uh, in, in cycle, and they were refusing to give more than five minutes of oxygen because they were worried about toxicity, as if life didn't oh, suck enough. Yeah. Uh, so this is what I suggest if your doctor doesn't give you <laughs> oxygen. And don't forget, it needs to be hard. Needs to be tight. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so it really doesn't make sense. Um, they're familiar with, with it in those situations, which really don't apply. Okay, that's great, Brian. Thank you so much. Um, we we have gone a little bit over time, but if you're happy to stay with us for a little longer, I I'm going to stay with you until you want to cut it. That's fine. Um, so right. I'm looking for you to when yeah, I'm happy to continue. I I'm happy to go on for, see, maybe another, where are we now? We'll see where um, we are with questions, yeah. Yeah, so let's maybe go for another 10 or 15 minutes, if you're comfortable with that, Brian. Yep. And uh, yep. our attendees, I'm sure, um, I don't even have to ask if they want you to stay for a little longer. I think the answer is, is yes. Um, I've had quite a lot of questions and comments about your opinions on uh, the vitamin D uh, regimen. Do you have any Yeah, very good, or? very good question. And um, I hope to add more scientific detail about that. Um, but initially, so um, most of the attendees will know that uh, one of the kind of patient-driven treatment options is taking high doses of vitamin D daily. Um, and... Um, the uh, pioneer on this, on the regimen, is, um, is uh, I've mind blank now, not flash, it's, um, uh, 
uh, who the name of the chap um, I've mind blanked on who who really knows more about this from an, uh, a regimen point of view. But anyway, oh, um, David Nickerson. Uh, and um, there's another name. I'm, um, but anyway, um, so th to give you an idea of what we're talking about. So the maximum recommended by the medical societies for daily dosing is 5,000 units. Uh, in the medical community, we give 50,000 a day on, uh, easily when we're supplementing initially uh, to lift up the level. Uh, the uh, primary care and physicians in general are only familiar with levels trying to supplement deficiency. Uh, this is not what's trying to be done here. They're trying to use it as a treatment. Um, so um, initially, I would suggest patients take 10,000 a day, but it turns out they probably need more than that. There are no studies in that setting. I'm totally reliant on patient experience. Now, um, uh, <clears throat> The our chap we were thinking about, Brian. Sorry to interrupt you. Is Batch Pete Batch, Batchelor? I meant Batch. Yeah. And, and yeah. Batch is a great sorry, resource. It, absolutely. Yes. Very uh, on, now, on the D, D from my point of view, you either go just on the D, or you go D plus other Batch has other um, um, supplements and vitamins which he suggests and has a rationale for absolutely every every one of them. Um, and again, it's unknown how much better the every uh, and you can't really go wrong though now let me tell you the levels you're going you can't go wrong as long as you have episodic blood tests you can go wrong if you don't if you never have blood tests so the level of d uh, physicians will be familiar with being in the 20s or 30s that's where we want it but um primary uh, most physicians would freak out at a level over 100, but they don't have to freak out. And I asked who, who, some person who is really the world expert in D, and I'm gonna go back to him for more detailed explanation. He said, he only worries when it's over 200. Yeah. Um, now, um, um, you need a calcium check as well because the toxicity of D is driven through high calcium. If you have a normal calcium, you're not D toxic. You may have a very high D, but you're not toxic. Um, and phosphorus could be measured as well. I have to find out more about other things. What I need to find out is about the super high doses, because there are folks that are driving their D well over 200. Now, there is a case, um, and the, the, the person uh, may attend and talk about it or not, but took over a million, well over a million units in one go, Wow. And that stopped their chronic headache, their chronic uh, cluster for a short bit, maybe a week, 10 days, when it didn't at lower doses. Now, he took that. And there were particular reasons for that because he would have difficulty taking it again due to what was coming up in his life. Um, I do not recommend that. So this um, was a one single dose. One single dose. After, okay. uh, after daily dosing, which was high, and then yes. he whacked it. And he whacked it and it helped. But, and then he followed the level down until it was manageable, I think. In a hundred, um, but the, I've seen levels 350. Uh, again, I don't recommend that. But um, I, I'm sidestepping how it might work, which is a scientific explanation. But, but D has been implicated in many, many, many things. Um, but it's an easy thing to recommend. 10,000 a day is never gonna get anybody toxic. Or I had a saw a level in the 200s recently, and I told the person, no, you're not taking the 10,000, no, you're not taking 10,000 a day. You don't get to 250 or on 10,000 a day. Um, but I would be doing it if it was me um, I would be doing good doses. And a batch uh, has aggressive dosing. But as long as you get the level, uh, but hopefully you need an uh, understanding physician because they can get a little pissy and say they won't write the script for the level. Right. Um, 
Um, but it's, it's, it's intriguing that if it can switch it off at any dose, that's intriguing. Because most things, even an overdose, ain't gonna switch your cluster off. Yeah. So it's, it's a watch this space. And I think eventually we're gonna have some evidence, but we have no evidence now, so we're left to anecdote. So we're particularly interested. And it's the chronics is what in particular, because episodics can switch off at any time, but the chronics have more of insight into what's really, whether it's causative or not. And if so, they can stop the D. If it comes back, they can try it again. Yeah. Great. So um, I'm also being asked, again, another oxygen question. Um, have you found many cases where um, oxygen discontinued being effective? You know, no, so it's no, here. no, 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 I haven't. No. Um, now, you do need a good flow rate. So the evidence-based medicine is for 6 and 12 liters a minute. Uh, we're, we recommend at least 15. And there are folks who say they respond to 20 or higher, higher only. Um, the, it's not going to do you any harm. But uh, when you write a script for it, you need to be specific about a flow rate, not a range. Because sometimes the oxygen supply companies uh, freak out a bit when I write a range. So you, the lesson is write a 15 liters a minute, for instance. Um, uh, and um, with a non-rebreather mask. And for the, those of you who don't know, there are recommended non-rebreather masks that do not have holes in the mask. If it doesn't have holes in the mask, it shouldn't have elastic around to hold on. You have to hold it on yourself. Why? Because if you fall asleep, your mask pops off. Otherwise, if you have an elastic on the mask, you then you're suffocating yourself with no holes and your oxygen, if the oxygen runs out. Um, um, I have another question um, from Katie. Again, about D3, how often should um, the blood work be checked and what numbers are okay? And is there any difference between um, the acceptable numbers in chronic and episodic patients? Yeah, we know nothing about the differences in episodic and chronic. No. Um, but if it's below 200, the level is okay with me. And the calcium has to be normal. See, so the calcium is uh, abnormal, it's always bad. Okay. Uh, and how often would you recommend? Um, every few, every, it can be as little as every few months. It does depend on how often the dosing has changed. But it does not need to be monthly. So it's a bit very, it depends on how frequent a change, what the last level was. But it doesn't need to be very frequently, mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion. Okay, so, so Brian, I think we can maybe do one more question if you're good for that. And if sure. you have any more slides after this question, you could run through those. Um, Nick has asked, can you please cover the Kessman and LSD trials in more detail? Now, I know we may not have time to do that tonight, but perhaps- Well, I, t I, I will tell you that Dr. Schindler Great. is an expert on the trials side of yes. things. And if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you'll get some idea about what they're doing and the active psilocybin and LSD trials. Um, but the, the ketamine, ketamine uh, I will tell you that for years, and I have some slides here. Uh, where is it now? Here we are. Uh, for years, I've been advocating this um, as um, when other things fail, uh, as a nasal spray. You'll, 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 you'll see some chatter and literature on this, on ketamine for infusions. Problem is, that's enormously more expensive and it ain't covered by insurance. You can get um, a um, compounding pharmacy, uh, can give you a, key, a month's worth or two of ketamine for less than $100. You can spend a couple of thousand for an IV ketamine, uh, or there's a, a, a branded product of intranasal ketamine for psychiatry, which costs about $5,000 a month in the United States. 
uh, or or hundred dollars uh, for a compounding pharmacy. Um, and I started using this as an abortive nasal spray. I don't use the infusions; too expensive, too complicated, um, and more side effects. And you have to know what you're doing more so. Um, the um, the as an uh, as an abortive when, when the standard uh, abortive options fail, um, the and you'd have to do a number of nasal sprays. And I've experimented through the years with different dosings. I started at a low concentration. I have to admit, I've been rising it up, lifting it up. Um, so, and it became apparent that it was also had a prophylactic effect uh, at preventing attacks, not just treating abortive attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, tolerance is rapid, so it can tend to lose effect and you have to use more. So you really need to have a strict regimen of holidays. And there are various ways of doing that. Holidays meaning there are times when you don't take it, days per week, weeks per, per month, and you reset. Um, so, and you have to, I used to write as little as 50, 25 or 50 milligrams per mil, and now maybe a higher concentration is better. Um, when you take too much, you go dopey, drowsy, but just if you take too much Benadryl, the same thing happens. Admittedly, it's quite prominent. This is an anesthetic. It can be a general anesthetic at high enough doses, um, but and um, remains useful. Um, and it's, oh, it's an old medication and it's a good way of giving analgesia, even if you're opioid dependent, and there's no role for opioids in cluster headache, none. Um, uh, so there's a, yeah. Uh, so, so the trouble also with it is, good luck getting somebody to write it. You walk into your doc and say, um, can, can you write me some, some, some ketamine nasal spray? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's almost humorous because the patient is dead serious and the physician thinks what is what do i look like i mean i mean am i really what what, what what's that um right. uh, and so you have to identify somebody who kind of thinks they know what they're doing and has used it before you know, good luck getting a script off somebody who's never written that before. Good luck. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I've been doing, I've been writing that for years, periodic, small number. It's not, again, it's when other things fail. Um, it's, let, let me tell you, years ago, we brought two uh, cluster heads to cluster busters to talk about their experience with, with nasal ketamine because I thought the word, and these were, the worst of the worst, so to speak, and I mean that respectfully. Yes. And what I didn't count on was um, they were extraordinarily tired the next day. Why? Because there was a succession of people through the night knocking on their door, crying men looking for, to looking to try. Yeah. Um, so there's a great need uh, uh, and um, and it probably does have a role, you see, but it's not a wonder option. But and it's important for people who do get good relief to tell their story, because the evidence-based uh, based medicine is not there. And even if there is a trial showing it, physicians are going to be slow to write it, and we still need. Uh, to, uh, to learn from patient experience, which is why I bully patients I write it on to give me their detail, how they use it, what they learn about it. Great. Uh, there's a few more questions, Brian, but I, I think um, we'll let you go on with the rest of your slides and perhaps we can um, get back to some of our attendees with these, the, the answers to these questions. Or maybe I can forward them on for. Yeah, I'll be around. I'll be around all, me all meeting. I mean, yeah, I I'd like to show. I'd like to show uh, this slide. And the question can be asked: Well, can't we just cut the nerve? It's causing me hell. Cut it. And well, yes, but it turns out in pain medicine, 
that cutting nerves ends up not being a great idea. It was thought to be a good idea decades ago. And there are two case series looking at cutting, either completely cutting the trigeminal nerve. It means you're numb half face for the rest of your life, including the lips. You know how annoying a, dent, a, a dental procedure is when you're finished and your, your lips are still numb on one side well, that's permanent when the nerve is totally cut. Yeah. Imagine how it's annoying it is just for a few hours. And there are attempts to partially cut it, admittedly. And, um, and they may be able to retain some of the sensation around the mouth. But the Mayo Clinic used to do it. Uh, and uh, Don, uh, and yeah. thank you for your, your story, Don, and your experience. It was wonderful. Uh, to talk to you. Um, he had a complete section of a, a left side, completely gone. He was chronic, but it gave him 32 years of complete relief. He's had a little bit of recurrence as some sensation has returned. It's likely because the other one started to take over and to cross over a little bit. But it gave him incredible relief. But I think he told me that he was told at the Mayo and follow-up, he was the only one who spoke positively of it. And uh, this was a trial of that. So was 17 patients and he was one of them. Um, see, but of the 17, uh, 13 had a complete section, complete cut and four partial and a, a mean of about seven years follow up. But nearly all of them had complete or near complete relief right after the procedure. Two had recurrence and had repeat surgery. One died and two developed cluster on the other side. Now that's a bummer. Um, mm -hmm. And the London study as well wasn't so hot. So we kind of stopped doing it, you know, stop mutilating patients. Um, and I have a, I'm not going to go into this so much, but there is a great story, uh, which we probably don't have time for. Um, the, uh, and this is, um, lithium is used for prophylaxis. Um, uh, people, uh, physicians don't like to use it as much, not because of its connotations, but it needs more oversight, more blood tests. And if you go, if your level goes high, you go a bit balmy, you go bonkers, you go confused mm -hmm. in a way that you, you don't see so much with other medications. You also have to restrict the amount of anti-inflammatories you take because that can push the level high. And so it's a harder drug to use in practice. Um, the <clears throat> point I try to make to physicians all the time is it's very clear from the law here in the United States that it's you can counsel patients on treatments even if those treatments are illegal, so-called Schedule 1. Schedule 1 contains um, medications and drugs that are not prescribable. Uh, from the hallucinogens. Um, it does not include cocaine because cocaine is a local anesthetic and can be used in medical practice. It does include marijuana. So marijuana is more highly scheduled than cocaine in the United States. Um, and my message is that, and, I, and the, it's clear from the court judgments that in cases that have gone to court, they've always judged on, in favor of physicians when they're counseling patients, you can counsel patients on treatments, even such as the hallucinogens. And that, that's what makes it easy for me to do that. I don't tell people to do that, but I answer questions and I answer their questions. I don't shy away from it. And I, it's a bit cringeworthy to hear all the stories of patients um, uh, lack of, of communication when they have, bring up uh, treatments which are Schedule One for, with physicians. Um, questions? Okay, let's just have a little look here. Not so many, so many questions, but comments. Lots of con comments about ketamine. Um, Andrew has uh, very kindly offered to share his personal experience about nasal ketamine after this session on Facebook Messenger. 
Um, lots of people have had a resounding no from their neurologist or what, when asking for ketamine. <laughs> or, or, hell, or hell no. <laughs> uh, hell no. Um, here's some steroids and some verap milk. Bye bye. So this is, you know, this is quite evident here in these comments um, that, I, that I'm reading. So um, most of them are just comments. Um, lots of people have thanked you, Brian, for your slides. Someone has asked if, are your slides available after the conference? I don't know if you- I guess I can, I, 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 can you know, I can help you out if you reach out to me. I'll be around yeah. the whole conference. The, the, the opinion is that, you know, the, the slides were great and uh, factual, but humorous. <laughs> Just like you, Brian. Thank you, thank you. Funny guy, know your stuff. Um, lots of compliments. Everybody's thanked you for being so informative and, you know, and, and keeping it on a level that people can understand. As sometimes, you know, some physicians can talk um, a medical jargon, which some of us understand and some don't. Um, so it's nice to do it uh, on a level where people know exactly where they are so we thank you so oh, thanks for the positive feedback and and i gain i gain a lot of understanding and information from patients as i keep saying um it's incredibly and richly informative to me 